Hello, and welcome to this Bitcoin Magazine interview. I am Vlad, and my guest today is a constitutional lawyer and a senior counsel, and his name is Justin Wales. And he has published a research paper about Bitcoin in relation to the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And I read it, and I had my mind blown by the complexity of the argument, because it has long been argued that code is speech, but it wasn't as complexly presented as, as if it's rooted in, in the intentions of the founding fathers. And it's basically what he wrote that is a historical approach to how we got to this point where Bitcoin should be considered free speech. And I'm gonna let you talk more about it. If you want to read the article, it's published by the University of Miami Law Review. It's in volume 74, number one, and it got published on the 22nd of November, 2019. So hello, Mr. Wales. Hi, thanks for having me. It's really good to have you. So why is Bitcoin free speech? So let me maybe explain to you why we decided to write this article. I wrote it alongside um, one of my colleagues named Richard Ovalman, who's uh, a, a a very important and well-known First Amendment lawyer um, and has been for the last 35 or 40 years. Um, uh, so one of the issues that we often see when governments are passing regulation on Bitcoin or when courts are asked to interpret whether the sale of Bitcoin uh, involves money transmission or implicates some of these financial regulations is we look at Bitcoin in a very narrow way. We say, well, Bitcoin is a currency, currency or money. There's all this regulation on, on top of money. And when you look at some of the arguments that courts have put out in interpreting, you know, whether a transaction is implicating a money transmitter um, statute or, or, or something similar, they're only focused on that narrow financial uh, use case of Bitcoin. But if you take a step back and you really look at what Bitcoin is, is it's a network and it's a decentralized network that allows all of us to communicate in different ways with each other. And in order for that decentralized infrastructure to um, work, it has a currency that incentivizes you know, the miners and everyone to act um, uh, in the best interest of the network as, as a whole. And I think that's kind of fascinating and it, it changes the way that we can communicate with one another. And it also, uh, you know, uh, means that what a Bitcoin is, is it's connected to this larger network and it's not necessarily only money. It's not necessarily only a financial tool. So if it's more of an expressive communicative tool, then there are all types of rights and implications that um, protect communicative, expressive, political um, platforms. And what we argue is that not necessarily that it's a one-to-one -one ratio. You need to put all of the First Amendment rights into Bitcoin. You can't regulate Bitcoin. But it's saying you need to look at this as a more holistic, expressive platform and not just a tool for financial transactions and think about whether we really want to place the same type of regulations that we do on money or other, you know, kind of a bearer instrument, stocks and bonds onto this platform. And we argue that you know, we have to start thinking about this and courts and regulators need to think about the broader implications before they start passing regulations. Yes, yeah, so I know that this has been a debate for years and scholars in legal studies have been struggling to basically figure out what Bitcoin is. Because at one layer, you can say, okay, it's money. It gets transmitted and people agree that it has value. It has a valuation on international markets, which means that it can be regulated as money. But yeah. if you go to central bankers, they're going to say, no, this is not money. Just the stuff that we issue is money. So if something else exists and acts as money, then we should call it some kind of commodity or whatever classification, security or whatever they want to frame it as just to avoid the classification as money because to central bankers, acknowledging the money status can be regarded as some sort of defeat. But in law, it's always interesting and it's even more interesting in common law 
because I come from a civil law system where yeah. it's all very clear. It's defined within some boundaries. But in common law, you have all these decisions by judges that all combined generate the image of what Bitcoin is and what kind of legal status it has. It's, 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 very, it's very complicated. One of the issues that we have in the United States is you have state regulators passing uh, regulations on virtual currencies generally that conflict with sometimes what federal agencies are saying. Sometimes you see different agencies within the same system. So the IRS treats virtual currencies differently than the SEC, which treats virtual currencies differently sometimes in the CFTC. So you don't see a lot, you know, it, it creates a very fractured system that makes it very difficult for a person to operate. You also have issues like, for instance, in Florida. Florida, the Office of Financial Regulations, does not view Bitcoin as money, such as to apply its money transmitter regulations. However, courts within Florida view it as money. So you have an agency taking a different determination than the courts. And what does that leave for someone trying to just decide whether they want to or can sell Bitcoin either as a business or as a non-business? It means that you may or may not be um, in violation of the law. You may or may not be subject to criminal liability, depending on who you ask. And, and it it's, it's becomes impossible to really operate a business or, or even to participate in this with this new technology. So one, one of the things that we do in this paper, and we try to make it very clear, is we are only really talking about Bitcoin. There are lots of virtual currencies. There are lots of decentralized networks. There are different levels of decentralization among the networks. We're really trying to focus on Bitcoin. And we try to give some principles about why we think Bitcoin may be viewed as a more expressive platform than, than some others. But one of the problems that we have at both a judicial level and a regulatory level is most of the time the courts, the regulators are passing regulations or making interpretations with very broad strokes. They're saying, well, all virtual currencies are X. All, you know, uh, Bitcoin is Ethereum, is virtual currencies, is Ripple, is BitConnect, is whatever. And that becomes very difficult because these are very, very different types of technology sometimes with very different use cases. Some of them are very centralized. Some of them are very decentralized. They have different, they have different um, positives and, and negatives. And one of the arguments that we make is that if you're trying to really pass regulations, you need to be cognizant of some of the differences because what you don't want to do is put regulations that will make it impossible for me to use, you know, whatever type of uh, platform, whatever type of, 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 you know, decentralized network in a way that might, um, really benefit how we can express ourselves and communicate with each other just because you're trying to stop investors from being scammed, which I think is, is an important goal of, of regulators. But an, an equally important goal is to make sure that technology isn't um, uh, regulated to the point where you can't use it and you can't get all the benefits that could come from it. Before we started recording this interview, you told me that you're the, you're the expert in Bitcoin within your legal firm law firm yeah. i mean and was there a moment in your activity when you radically disagreed with the regulations that happened to be passed in florida or at the federal level in the united states and did you try to lobby or produce some kind of intellectual output which contradicts the authorities and the regulators yeah, well, so let me give you maybe a little bit of, of my background, which I think is important to understanding my perspective. Um, I work at a firm called Carlson Fields. It's about a 500-person law firm, and it's it's me and two other lawyers who are, I would say, the the experts at on 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 this type of technology. It's me. It's a guy named Matthew Cohen, and then it's a guy named Drew Hinkis, who um, you might know on Twitter as Propel Forward. He's 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 also a professor at NYU on uh, cryptocurrencies and and the three of us r really do most of the work at, at, at the firm in this in this specific area now the way I got into Bitcoin is I think a little different than how most people get into it most people I, I believe get into it because they see that there's a big price fluctuation there's a way of, of investing in money 
I got into it because I, um, I saw it was a tool for expression. So if you recall years and years ago, um, the Obama administration had placed um, an embargo on donations to WikiLeaks. And I was in, in law school at, at the time. And I remember I was following Julian Assange on, on Twitter and Julian Assange tweeted out and said, if you want to donate, um, donate through Bitcoin. Because at the time, American Express and Visa and all these other payment processors said, we're not going to process donations to WikiLeaks. So I I said, hold, hold on a second. I'm, I'm on a conference. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, they were wishing me a happy Thanksgiving. It's Thanksgiving tomorrow in, in the United States. Um, so uh, I was um, noticing that he was saying, well, donate through, through Bitcoin. And I called up a, a friend of mine who was at MIT at the time. And I said, explain to me wh what Bitcoin is. And, and, and he did. And the first instance of, of me really understanding it was that it was a tool for communication. The financial aspect of it and the market fluctuation and everything else that we usually talk about, kind of I learned after the fact, but the first instance was, okay, it's, it's communicative. As my practice started to grow and I started to get more and more involved, I noticed that as I was reading regulations um, that were being proposed, they were all really hyper-focusing on the investment aspect of it. And one of the, uh, we maybe can, can, can link this in, in the article, but another um, article that I, I draft and, and that I write, um, that I update every three months is for a publication called Thompson Reuters, which is like the main legal publication. And I write along with Matt Cohen, their treatise on state regulations on blockchain and virtual currencies. And I have to update it every three months because it, it changes among every the states so so often. But what you see is wildly contradictory regulations. So some states, Wyoming is a great example. Wyoming passes regulations that make it very easy for for people to you know transact in virtual currencies to start virtual currency businesses. But other states make it very very difficult, and they they take sort of um, a draconian view on this type of technology. So it's, it's always been frustrating because what I always try to argue is you can't really regulate a technology. You regulate behavior. And once you start regulating technology, it's very easy for me as a lawyer to explain why your regulations don't necessarily fit what I'm trying to do because technology, every type of technology is different. Bitcoin today is not the same as Bitcoin eight years ago, nine years ago. Ethereum is not the same as Bitcoin. Ripple is not the same as Ethereum. So if you're just saying virtual currencies, you're really not understanding what the purpose behind the, the technology is. Um, I've been involved in, in helping state governments understand some of these nuances. And in, in some, some cases, it's been very successful. I think the Florida's, Florida's Office of Financial Regulation, I think, has benefited from, from what me and some of my colleagues have done in educating them about some of the nuances of the technology. The problem becomes is because we're a common law system, you have a, a regulatory agency say one thing, and then because there's a court case, it's a criminal case, it goes up through an appellate court, you now have a, an appellate decision that might be contradictory, and you have you know regulatory chaos. So one of the ideas behind writing this article was how do we write an article that is directed to regulators and directed to judges and it, it gives i think a pretty good explanation about what the technology is specifically bitcoin how it developed how it works while at the same time walking through how did the first amendment develop what are the principles behind the first amendment and the audience is really someone who maybe they've heard of bitcoin and virtual currencies They've certainly heard of um, the First Amendment, but we want to give really all of the background you need to understand how the two worlds come together and can influence each other. So let's say that tomorrow, but not tomorrow because it's Thanksgiving, on right. Monday, you get hired to work as an advisor to the regulators, and you're mm -hmm. supposed to inform them what Bitcoin is and yeah. how they should draft legislation for it. So. How would you approach it and what would you tell them to do in regards to Bitcoin? What is the regulation that should exist according to your view? Well, again, it's don't try to enact legislation that regulates Bitcoin. Figure out what types of behavior you want to prevent 
and then work backwards from there. So for instance, what you see is a lot of, a lot of um, states, they want to protect investors from being defrauded. Well, okay, well, there's already securities regulations at a federal level. There's already securities regulations at a state level. You can um, regulate my, what I, you know, how I present an investment opportunity. You can regulate who can invest in, in my investment opportunity. Um, that doesn't mean that every virtual currency is a security. It doesn't mean that every virtual currency is a commodity. You have to look at the individual security and make a, or an individual asset and make a, a determination. So the first question I, I often ask regulators is, do you need new regulation to achieve your purposes? Or is a better um, strategy to look at the existing regulations you have that protect investors or that um, apply to money transmitters um, and just apply those to instances where someone is making, uh, selling an investment or someone is, um, you know, um, using Bitcoin or a virtual currency in the way that the statutory definition of money transmitter already exists, right? Same thing with money laundering, same thing with embezzlement. There's not necessarily a need to create new regulations that name a specific technology because we have regulations that benefit behavior. So I think that's really the, the, the first question. And if you really look at what um, has been enacted uh, on, I would say, the negative side. So like Wyoming, for instance, has enacted a lot of legislation that's um, you know, affirmative. They want to make it easier for people to use uh, Bitcoin to, for people to start you know, these types of businesses. But if you look at the negative um, uh, regulations that are passed, I think a lot of them are pretty unnecessary. And the same behavior could be stopped or regulated by just enforcing existing uh, rules. So um, I think that's, that's really the, the first and primary question uh, when I talk to regulators or people who are wondering whether they are being regulated by a state. I think that the United States finds itself in a very specific situation where it has the dominant currency around the world. So consequently, it also has very harsh regulations in regards to Bitcoin. Whereas you, you see that other allies of the United States, such as France, for example, or Switzerland, they are very permissive and have drafted legislation which enable Bitcoin businesses and all of this industry to develop within their country as they feel like they can advance and possibly at some point in the future, they might have an edge. So do you feel like the United States is being left behind by these policies? No, I, not really. And I think part of it is that, you know, like people like you, people like me, I'm sure everyone who's watching this or reading Bitcoin magazine, we, we think about Bitcoin all day long, every day, it's top of mind. But I think it's, it's still a relatively small asset. And I think from a US government's perspective, it's, it doesn't pose the type of, of threat that I think a lot of us in the industry think the government thinks it poses. I think they're, for the most part, they're waiting to see what happens, where does it grow? I think a lot of that has to do with what the secondary market is and, and, and what, you know, uh, how people are adopting the uses of, of, of Bitcoin. So right now it's, it's still relatively difficult for me to, to use this virtual currency for anything other than a, a volatile investment opportunity. I think once you start seeing different applications being built that will allow me to use Bitcoin for not only transactions, but also, and in the paper I talk, but all the non-financial things you can use with decentralized networks, right? Uh, 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 proof of publication, you can use colored coins to transfer uh, assets. You can have provenances of different types of assets using the Bitcoin network. We've seen Microsoft, um, develop identity verification tools. You're looking at things that like uh, Tyrion is doing in terms of um, allowing users to uh, publish things onto uh, the blockchain to authenticate when the publication occurred, or even some of the political and expressive um, uh, uh, content that has been published directly onto the blockchain. And we go in through some of this in, in, in the paper. Once that starts to develop, I, I think, U.S. regulations could cause 
it to maybe miss out on opportunities. But 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 right now, I, I, I don't necessarily think think it does. I spoke to Tone Vase about two months ago, and I'm not sure I, if you follow Tone Vase, but yeah, I've been is. on his I've been on his um podcast a couple times. Yeah. Okay, he is very much into trading, and yeah, the comparison that he made in order to express his view on regulations is that if he takes home some euros from Europe during his trip, and he goes to United States, and in the meantime, the euro appreciates in value. He's not going to get taxed for the small amount that he brought home. Yeah. But in, in the case of Bitcoins, for every amount, the IRS wants to tax you. And he said that there is a need for some kind of leeway. And this was one of his main concerns. And also, he's, when he referred to regulations, he said that he regards the market as a table where all the poker players have $100 chips. And sometimes you have a player who has a million dollars and comes to your table. And the problem is not that he has a million dollars in chips, but that he should follow the exact same rules as the other ones. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think Tone um, has a point in, 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 in some regards. I, really, the way the US government taxes crypto makes it just very challenging for the adoption of crypto. Now, whether that is because they're really trying to make it difficult for this to catch on, which I think a lot of people um, believe, or it's just that they say, well, the majority of people who are using this type of technology are doing it for investment purposes. Therefore, we're going to treat fluctuations in the price of, of, of Bitcoin as capital gains because it's just what most people are doing is I think up for debate and I, I, I don't I don't know the answer. But I, I will say this. If you go through the paper and you look at all of the expressive uses of a decentralized network like Bitcoin and you recognize and you accept and this is the first I think thing that I, I tell judges or I tell I tell regulators, if you accept the idea that the Bitcoin network can be used for other things and purely investment purposes then you can't necessarily tax every transaction in Bitcoin as uh, a calculation of capital gains because it makes it very difficult for me to use all of the different things that I can with, with the Bitcoin network. So here's an example. One of the things that we did um, with the paper is we took a hash of the paper and we burned a small amount of Bitcoin, an insignificant amount of Bitcoin to that hash in order just to, to demonstrate that we publish it at a certain time. Now, that is a completely non-financial transaction. In fact, I lost money on the transaction. It's completely non-financial. It was purely expressive. Same thing if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to put um, a message through arbitrary data into a Bitcoin block, right? If I want to say January 3rd, 2009, chance on the brink of second bailout, I just wanted to publish that message. It's completely non-transactional, a uh, non-financial transaction. So if the only way that I'm able to make that type of um, communication is through the purchase of Bitcoin and holding Bitcoin, then why is it that I should be paying for fluctuations in the price of Bitcoin um, as a capital gains? It, 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 may, it puts a tax on, on expression. Now, there's an argument that sometimes is, is made, which is I can take a $20 bill and I can write, you know, a note or, a, a, you know, a, I can draw a picture on that $20 bill and it's still a $20 bill. And the fact that I'm putting some art on that doesn't mean that it's no longer money and it's no longer subject to regulation. And that's true. But Bitcoin is fundamentally different. And the reason why is because the Bitcoin network was not purely created as a virtual currency. It was not purely created as a cryptocurrency. It was created as a network. And in order to use that network, it requires a virtual currency, right? It requires this game theoretical um, infrastructure that allows me to do all sorts of things. And we saw from the very first block, there was a political message put into that. And I go through it in, in the paper. There's all sorts of reasons, both practical and philosophical behind the creation of the Bitcoin network. And, you know, you can, a lot of, a lot of the, the research was done was taking Satoshi's own words 
A lot of it was based on other um, uh, organizations, including the Electronic Freedom Foundation, as well as um, Andrei Santinopoulos has a lot of, of, of speeches and, and writings a, a, about this. But it's a network. So if it's a network and it allows you to do all these other things, you need to necessarily treat it differently as than a $20 bill, which can only be used as currency, and then art placed on top of it. Whereas the actual infrastructure of Bitcoin can allow all types of different expression. And to quote Andres Antonopoulos, actually, um, Bitcoin is not money. Bitcoin does money. It's an application that and it's the, maybe the first and maybe it's the best at this point application of the Bitcoin network. But I think five, 10, 15 years from now, we're going to look back at Bitcoin and we're going to say, oh, okay, there's a lot that we can actually do with this. It's really a transformative um, technology. And, and you know, a lot of my day is spent trying to explain the technology or, or to talk about these things to people who are not necessarily um, uh, familiar with technology in, in general. And one of the things that I, I often say is, think back to 1996 on the internet. And I asked you, I said, Vlad, this is 1996, what is the internet? And what you would say is the internet is email. Well, that's true, right? I can email you on the internet. But in 1996, we couldn't have this conversation like we're having right now over the internet. I couldn't Venmo you or send you Bitcoin on the internet. I couldn't watch movies on the internet. I couldn't stream music on the internet. I couldn't do all these things. So if, if I were to say to you, what is the internet? You said email. Well, sure. But the internet is not only email, it does email, but it's everything else. It connects us in different ways. And I, and I sort of think of, of, of Bitcoin specifically as that next iteration. It does money, but it also has a potential if you really sort of think about all of the implications of, of having a truly decentralized global censorship resistant network that allows expression. You can do all sorts of different things. And, and, and that's really the point that we're trying to get across in this article. And when we talk to regulators and judges, that's what we're, we're trying to do. Would you argue that Bitcoin should not be subject to taxation as long as it doesn't affect the national economy? So if you just send an amount to somebody and it never gets converted to a fiat currency, then you think it should not be subject to taxation or to regulation up until the point when it enters the economy and the real world? I don't know. I mean, that, that's, I think, a, a more complicated question that I want to think about, but I'll, I'll, I'll maybe rephrase it and say this. I think that if you are holding on to Bitcoin as an investment and you have, you know, you have a, a thousand Bitcoin, you hold it on for, hold on to it for, for 10 years and it goes from, you know, being worth, uh, you know, what is it right now? Uh, 8,000 bucks, 7,000 bucks to a hundred thousand dollars a coin you should probably have to pay a capital gains tax on that because you're holding it on as, as to investment. You're using it as an investment. If you're using Bitcoin and you're holding on to some amount of Bitcoin, however, because you want to access the more, the, a, the global decentralized network and you're trying to use it for political, for expressive, for communicative purposes, then you probably shouldn't have to pay a capital gain. So the question really is how do we amend our tax code or how do we get the tax code to recognize that the technology can be used for different things and different things need to be treated in, in, in different ways. Now, this is something that I'm sure there are, are tax lawyers and, 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 and people who are, understand um, the implications of tax regulations more than I do um, can, can maybe opine about. My purpose is really to say not every use of Bitcoin is an investment and therefore the taxes shouldn't require that. Let's get back to the First Amendment. Sure. As we know it, it's part of the Bill of Rights, which was written by James Madison in mm -hmm. 1789, I think, or something around that time, ratified in 1791. I, I did some American history in college. Yeah. And at the time, I think the understanding of what freedom of speech was did not coincide with what we understand today. And I guess every generation finds the Bill of Rights, reads it, and gives it a different interpretation according to the technological evolution and the social norms that change. Yeah. And do you think that at any point, Madison envisioned that we would reinterpret 
his words for some sort of non-state money? Um, well, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to even predict what they could or could not understand, but I want to maybe just challenge on how you describe that because what you said is how, you know, how the, like the, the term freedom of speech was viewed in the, you know, late 18th century. Well, we go through this in, in the paper quite a bit, but there was no consensus at the time on what the term freedom of speech means. That was a concept that was made up during the draft, you know, during the drafting process. The phrase was not a commonly known phrase. So the idea that even at the time, what, you know, the, the term freedom of speech even had a consensus is, is kind of a misnomer. The second issue is that if you look at how the ratification process went, um, and who was actually supposed to ratify, it wasn't a democratic ratification. I mean, there's all sorts of people who were excluded um, from uh, the ratification process. Uh, blacks were excluded from the ratification process. Women were excluded from the ratification process. In some states, white men who didn't own property were excluded from the ratification process. So the ratification actually was a very small subset of, of, of folks who were the elected ratifiers, so not black, usually not non-property owners, not women, a small group who were elected to the ratification. So when we look at like how originalists, so Scalia is a, an originalist, right? Some of his disciples, uh, Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court, they're originalists. They look at what was the mindset of the ratifiers at the time of the ratification. So they're thinking about what was commonly understood by this incredibly small group of people. I think it might be something like 200 people in, in New York, right? What did they think about these terms like freedom of speech or the right to bear arms or you know um, due process? And the answer is, of course, is that there was no consensus on any of this. So the idea that we can even look back to the 18th century and think, well, what did this small group of people think about Bitcoin or surveillance of, you know, cell phones or abortion or any of these things that just were not, you know, commonly understood at the time is just um, is just a fallacy. So we, we go through a lot of these interpretive models of the First Amendment and, and show, well, it's it's really kind of a fool's errand to try to say, well, what, what would James Madison think about Bitcoin? Well, one, who cares? because how could he even understand what the implications were? And two, that's not really the question. It's like, how were you ever going to get a consensus, you know, hundreds of years ago on a technology that we're still just trying to wrap our head around in, in 2019? So, I, I mean, it might be a, a kind of a roundabout way of, of, of an answering your, your, your question, but one of the things that we argue is you look at, what is the purpose behind the First Amendment? And the purpose is, and there's a lot of different models, is it's a check on government, right? It's a way of, uh, you know, you have the First Amendment because you want to check government from becoming too powerful or becoming unopposed. It's a way of making sure that alternative belief systems, alternative philosophies don't get, um, you know, chilled such that they can't, you know, find, a, find an audience and, and, and grow. And... There's, there, there are several other kind of smaller, smaller interpretive models. And one of the things that we argue is if you look at like what the core function of Bitcoin was when it was created, um, it's specifically that. It's a check on government. It's a philosophical tool, right, saying, well, we don't necessarily believe that the best, the best entity to control um, our monetary system are governments that are prone to corruption, that are prone to mismanagement, we, we give several ex examples and, um, you know, from the very, very start, from the very first Genesis block, there was a, a, a political message put into that block. And what was it? It was saying that, um, you know, the, the, the chancellor's on the brink of the bailout of the banks. The financial system and the government system have conflated such that our economy is weaker than it should be. And... Uh, you know, I, I, we go through and kind of apply Bitcoin's philosophy and creation and application to some of these interpretive models in the paper, and and argue that you know it makes sense that you would uh, you would recognize First Amendment protections based on those things. Yeah, 
Sometimes in the Bitcoin community, you find this argument that Madison and Jefferson would very much be in favor of silver and gold. And they opposed the idea of a central bank in the United States. And it was Alexander Hamilton who came up yeah. with all this system. And possibly if they saw something like Bitcoin, which is universal and cannot be censored and is all about freedom of transaction, they would very much appreciate it as it's an extension of what gold and silver actually are. And they cannot be confiscated. And I know that private property is a big proposition of the American constitution. Sure. But that's why I ask this question, not because I want to make some kind of counterfactual and fallacious intellectual exercise, but because we have these ideas that came from the founding fathers and were passed on. And I think Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he was or she or it, was very much into this philosophy of having a neutral, a governmentally neutral currency that can be transacted without any kind of restrictions. Yeah, and you know, it might it might be maybe blasphemous as both a, a Bitcoiner and a constitutional lawyer to say, but it's interesting to think about what Thomas Jefferson or James Madison would have thought of. It's interesting to think of what Satoshi might have thought of, but I, I really believe that um, it, it doesn't really matter. And the reasons are, are, are kind of similar for, for both applications. One, there were a lot of things that Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and Alexander Hamilton believed that maybe made sense at the time that don't make sense hundreds of years later, right? So their interpretations of silver and gold and monetary policy and, and having you know, centrally backed, you know, strong centrally banked federal reserves it, it may make a lot more sense when you have a primarily um, agrarian society that's, you know, uh, homogenous. It's there's not an internet. There's not really international uh, economies with different um, kind of geopolitical issues at stake. The same thing is if you look at like what Satoshi put out, it was a, a very you know it was it was remarkably um, impressive his technology. But I don't even think Satoshi could have recognized what Bitcoin would have become. So it's it's grown in application, it's grown in purpose, it's grown in importance since he created it. And I think we need to, um, you know, be impressed that Satoshi, whoever he, she, or they were, created this thing. But in some ways, it's now for everyone else. So when we're creating regulations, when we're deciding how do we want to utilize this amazing technology, well, I don't really care what Satoshi thinks of it. I want to use it for the good of society. I want to make sure that Bitcoin is used as an expressive, communicative, political tool for people all over the world um, and that we're not stifling it by infighting within our community saying, well, this is really what Satoshi would have want. This is, you know, this is Satoshi's vision. Well, okay. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't care what Satoshi's vision is. We have this amazing piece of technology how do we best utilize that? And, and that's kind of one of the things that we're trying to argue in this, in this is that you, you, you need to, in some ways, kill your darlings. You need to, to disregard your heroes sometimes and say, well, what's the best use case right now? What's the best way of regulating right now? Because there's no way Satoshi would have understood how big this thing would become and how broad it could become today, you know, when he created it 10 years ago. Okay, so let's get back to your article. Sure. I can see that it's right in the title, this idea of protecting Bitcoin under the First Amendment. Yeah. The idea of government protection is very interesting in the case of something that no government can actually control. So where does mm -hmm. this protection actually come from? Sure, well, the First Amendment protects communication, it protects expression, it protects things like my right to interact anonymously in some some cases. So the protection is from the First Amendment. And the First Amendment is broad over the last you know, several hundred years. The um, uh, uh, Supreme Court and you know, kind of secondary and tertiary courts in the United States have recognized a lot of implied rights that you would not necessarily see if you just read the, the First Amendment. I mean, the First Amendment is, is, I think, 60, maybe, I don't know, 60 something words. 
Um, but there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of interpretive judicial opinions uh, about what do those words actually mean. So um, I would argue, and sometimes I, I, I do argue this, uh, for, you know, in, in court or to, to regulators, that there's not a necessarily a need to um, uh, enact new protections of, of Bitcoin because they're already there. And if you look at, we quote this case called um, uh, Peckingham versus North Carolina. And um, I don't have actually my, my paper in front of me, but to paraphrase, uh, the United States Supreme Court says that the nature of a revolution in thought is that the people behind that revolution don't necessarily know where it will, um, it will lead. And that was in a case from 2017 that applied to the state of North Carolina enacted a regulation that prevented people who were on uh, probation from, from jail from, uh, for child sex offenses um, from being allowed to use the internet, um, any site on the internet that allowed children to interact with it. So a guy who was um, on probation, uh, he posted a, a thing on Facebook about getting a parking ticket, his parole officer, um, or fighting a parking ticket, I think it was, his parole officer then um, uh, arrested him, saying you violated your parole, and he challenged that and went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And what the court did was like really quite amazing. What they said was, you can't create a regulation that just prevents someone from accessing all of the expressive, communicative, behavioral benefits of a technology as broad as the internet. And regulators and courts need to be really cognizant of the fact that we don't know right now where the internet will lead. We don't know how technology will develop. And you want to maybe take like a, 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 a soft touch. Now, what's interesting with the quote where they say the nature of a revolution in thought is that they're using that to apply to Facebook and apply to the internet. But the original quote was from Benjamin Rush talking about the U.S. democratic experience during the American Revolution. It's the same thing, is that we didn't know in you know the 1700s what the United States, what democracy would look like 200 years later. We don't know right now what all the implications of having a truly connected global society look like. So as a regulator, as a court, as a prosecutor, what have you, when you're making a decision, think about what all the implications could be, recognizing that you will never be able to, 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 to know what all the implications are. So we kind of use that case and that quote as a framing device for um, how do we interpret the First Amendment as applied to these types of technologies that are evolving, that we may not have a full understanding of what the implications are. And uh, the result, I think, is that regulators, we need to have a lighter touch and we really need to lean on the experts um, about where this all can, can go. And, and um, you know, that's, that's I really think, the, the main purpose behind this paper is to say, we don't know a lot. So let's just recognize how little that we know. Let's not pretend that we understand what Bitcoin will look like 10 years from now or 100 years from now. And let's not create regulations or put people in jail or, um, you know, create case law that will have to, like, be, um, you know, sort of uh, amended in the future uh, just because we're trying to solve the case in front of us. We need to solve the cases that will come 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 years from now. Yeah, that's, I guess, the wisest of approaches, even though most people, especially those in government, don't really think in the long term. They just think about getting reelected and fixing the problem right now. And that can lead to a lot of bad consequences and a, a lot of instability and in the legislative framework. But I wanted to get back to the idea of protecting Bitcoin with constitutional means. Sure. And you can protect, you cannot interfere with the network, but you can interfere with the means of communication, right? So you can mm -hmm. stop people from running their own nodes. You can stop people from accessing any kind of internet address which contains the word Bitcoin. 
So if you are a government and you have absolute control over the means of communication, you can filter certain websites. And I think even the United States as the freest of countries around the world has its own series of filters on the internet. And you can also block people from mining on the territory of the United States. You can just name that an illegal activity and that's very hard to do because it has a lot of energy consumption and there is some data transfer that's required and that's why I guess Blockstream has released the satellite yeah. in space. So what is your take in regards to this? Yeah, so look, I think you, I think a lot of those proposals or those hypotheticals are functionally impossible to really enforce in the United States for, for a couple reasons. So when we talk about the First Amendment, we say the First Amendment, but really there are several different provisions in the First Amendment. So one of the provisions is uh, freedom of the press. Another provision is um, you know, related to the Establishment Clause and whether the government can be entangled in religion. Another is freedom of association. Another is the ability to petition the government. So when you think about like, um, can, I, can the government pass a law making it illegal to run a node or illegal to mine? Well, it's very difficult because what does it mean for me to run a node? Like, what it, it means I'm running a, a piece of software, fine, but if that software is connected to a larger network, I'm participating in that network to keep track of uh, all of the Bitcoin transactions. I'm keeping a record of the transactions. Well, what is that? That's association. I'm just saying that I want to be associated with that network. And why do I want to be associated with the network? For political reasons. Because I want to make sure that that network is strong and every person who runs a node is doing a benefit to the, the broader network. Okay, well, it's very clear that you have associational rights. That Packingham case that I was mentioning before dealt with the association um, and associational rights regarding the internet. So it would be really, really difficult, I think, for a a the federal government or a state government to make that type of thing illegal. It's the same thing with mining, right? Because mining is also is I am I am working with everyone else, uh, all of all of the other miners around the world, to um, uh, maintain the integrity of the Bitcoin network through donating my uh, uh, computational, uh, you know, uh, equipment and, 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 and trying to mine Bitcoin. Now you can pass tax rules regarding what happens when I actually mine a Bitcoin. You know, you can, you can regulate sort of the financial end to it, but just the actual participation is, I think, very, very difficult. That's not to say that you can't do it um, in other countries, but other countries don't have a as broad of a First Amendment as, as we do. And, and I just think it would be really difficult if, if that case was ever actually litigated for any court to say that there's no associational rights to, to uh, mine or, or Bitcoin or to run, run a node. Yeah, I, I guess you just gave me a lot of food for thought because I didn't quite analyze through this lenses. And it's very easy to think about the concept of banning mining and running a node, but mm -hmm. it's, it's more difficult to figure out all the intricacies involved and how, how hard it is actually for the, go the government to do it, especially in a democratic state, which has such a long history of respecting freedom of speech. And I never really quite regarded joining the Bitcoin network as freedom of association. No, oh, yeah. I mean, to, 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 to me, it's, it's um, kind of a, a core aspect of being a participant in this entire industry is you got to run your own node. You have to participate because um, the more decentralized we are, the, the, the more broader the network becomes, the more difficult it is to, to really regulate it. And, and one of, here's actually something that's kind of interesting. We don't go into purposefully in our article um, the security, non-security questions of uh, 
uh, whether a token is or is not a security, right? Which is, is really what a lot of the literature, a lot of the discussion among lawyers uh, has become. We mentioned it briefly in a couple footnotes, but just so, you know, uh, they don't think that we forgot about it. Um, but if you look at like what the SEC has said regarding when does something become a security or not become a security, there's this analysis that kind of needs to come where are, are you sufficiently decentralized? So what has the SEC said? Um, what examples have the SEC given regarding whether a, a token is or is not sufficiently decentralized? Well, Bitcoin, sufficiently decentralized. Okay, fine, we'll agree to that. Ethereum, also from the SEC's perspective, seems to be sufficiently decentralized. Well, we all know from the DAO, Ethereum is less decentralized than Bitcoin. It's more decentralized than a lot of other tokens. So there's some line, and we don't exactly know where, where that line is, but there's some line that the regulators say is present such that once you pass it and you are sufficiently decentralized, you, you have less regulations, you have maybe great, greater rights. Um, and one of the arguments that we make in, in, in our paper is that the, the First Amendment applications are not necessarily the same when you have a token that is not as decentralized as Bitcoin. We kind of say, well, Bitcoin is the most decentralized, therefore we are going to use that as an example. But maybe there are some other you know, decentralized networks that are, you know, maybe Ethereum, for instance, also has First Amendment rights that are applicable. We don't make a determination, yes, yes or no. But if you believe that these associational rights, these expressive rights, these political rights should attach, then you should do everything you can to participate in the network. You should mine, you should run a node, because every person who does, every satellite we have, makes it more difficult to make the argument that, no, this is really just a financial transaction network, just like PayPal or Venmo. Well, no, it's not, because no one's controlling it. There's not that same editorial uh, editorial um, sort of uh, uh, characteristic. An another example that we use in the paper is we talk a lot in the community about the forks, right? So you have Bitcoin, Bitcoin splits to Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Cash splits to Bitcoin Satoshi's Vision, there's Bitcoin Gold, there's all, all of these different Bitcoins. So how does a regulator view that? They say, aha, you have one type of asset and it's splitting to another type of asset and to another type of asset. But this is what we argue. This is an example of how this is an association. Because just like if I wanted to have, I have um, uh, a political party, right? I have Justin's political party and I have a hundred people in it. And at some point, my political party takes a stance on you know, monetary policies that 40% of the people, 40 of the people in, in the party disagree with. What are they gonna do? They're gonna start their own political party and they're gonna try to recruit people and say, my political party is better. Well, it's the exact same thing with, with Bitcoin. You have Bitcoin, you have um, uh, complete freedom from miners, complete freedom from people who operate nodes to decide whether they want to maintain that chain with those specific protocols. And if they disagree with it, they're completely free to start a new chain or to fork that chain. And then they're just, it's just trying to convince the, the network that their vision is correct. So in, in that sense, the very essence of running, a, of, of participating in, in Bitcoin is a political action. It's an associational action. And it's the same thing. If you decide that Bitcoin Cash is a better version of Bitcoin than Bitcoin is, then um, you're free to do that. That's your associational right. And I think in some ways that's the, the ability to fork is also protected under, under the First Amendment and the ability to say, um, you know, I don't like what the, the core devs are doing. I'm moving this way. Um, you know, there, there's, these, are, these are issues that I don't think have really been explored. And our paper, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a long paper. It's something like 73 pages and like 270 footnotes or something like that. It's still not long enough to explore all of these issues. And, and hopefully people will say, well, let me write an article about forking. Let me write an article about taxation and try to use some of these First Amendment frameworks and technology frameworks that we've created and we've, we've written about as, as a way of exploring these other issues.
That was actually the next question that I was going to ask you. Will you publish more articles on the same topic and will you have them academically reviewed and published in this type of journal? Yeah, I mean, look, it's um, one of the challenges of writing an article like this is it's, it's subject to academic review. It's a long editorial process. I started writing this article in October of 2018. It, I mean, it was a bear to, to, to put together. You have to go through just a lot of editorial steps. Every citation needs to be vetted. It's, it's a lot. So I don't have any plans right now to subject myself to the, to the same, you know, I mean, I have, I have other things that I'm focusing on right now, but um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm going to continue to write and to speak about the interface between the application of the First Amendment and, and Bitcoin, and also um, continue to work on my treatise on how states are, are applying uh, regulations to this type of technology. But I don't, I don't have, um, you know, sort of a part two that I'm, I'm starting right now. Um, but I can, I can certainly think off the top, top of my head of several, if any lawyers or, or researchers are, are, are watching this right now, um, topics that I think should be explored more are um, risks and liabilities associated with um, forking is, is like a really good topic. How taxation and, and the First Amendment kind of compete with each other to influence how tax um, policies are created. Another great example, and, and we talk a bit about this in, in this paper, is um, liability for transactions. So if you really take a step back and you think about when I send you a Bitcoin or a fraction of a Bitcoin, what am I really doing? I'm not actually sending you anything. We have just as a community agreed that I have five and you have four. And when I want to send you one, so you have five and I have four, I don't send you anything. It's an atomic transaction. It's, it's, it's not, it, I never send anything. I just go and I tell the entire network, everyone now recognize that I only have four and you have five. So there's not an actual transfer. So there's a lot of different issues related to custody, right? The, related to um, uh, liability for a failure in custody, related to transactions uh, when I'm trying to send something or I'm trying to bring something from one place to another related to um, whether a court can compel production of a private key, like these types of things that relate to what does it mean to actually hold on to an asset that's digital that need to be explored um, both under like a First Amendment analysis and also under like a Fourth Amendment due process analysis. And, and I, I'm not really seeing a lot of really great academic writing on these topics. And, and hopefully this is just the first instance of, of, a, you know, of, of really exploring these issues from a more nuanced perspective. Okay, so just in Wales, it was a pleasure to talk to you and I feel like I have learned a lot throughout the last hour. Yeah, well, yeah, th thanks, thanks everyone. If you wanna find more information out about me, you can go to uh, justinwales.com and that'll link you to my um, my uh, uh, firm website and on that you can find copies of this article and, and also the treatise on state regulations if you if you want okay so thank you very much and i hope that we will talk again maybe whenever you publish something new all right thank you man.